All right. Can we, can, we get away from, can we get away from the specific charges that you make against President and Vice President and deal with the issues that this country is facing and what was said at the UN? And I put to you, can the UN, the question that was asked, can the UN have any credibility if for almost 10 years Iraq has ignored its resolutions? Um, I think that Bush today declared the United Nations irrelevant by saying, by essentially the threat that he issued, saying that we're going to go ahead and do it anyways, whether you do it or not. So he's essentially saying, this is just kind of a waste of my time. I'm here, you're here, we're all in New York, uh, uh, but uh, we're going to go do what we want to do, even if it is against the will of the American people or the British people. And, and the arrogance of that and how that's viewed around the world is, is appalling. And I want to just say to people who are watching yeah. this around the world that that is not representative yeah. of the majority of Americans. Okay, hold on, hold on, check, check hands there. We'll have some more on this point. Thank you. Well, I've spent probably uh, half my adult life outside of this country, and, and I would have to agree, I don't feel that the American people and the essential goodness of this people is being well represented outside of, of America by certain flawed foreign policies that this country has and continues to have. And, and what, what I really fear, if we're talking about security and the future, um, I very seriously fear a world in which over 70% of the people do not have a potable drinking water that we're dealing with massive poverty. Uh, we're looking, if you look just at the Arab world alone, you're, you're dealing with extraordinarily high birth rates and populations that have unemployment of sometimes 25%. Now, we can't, uh, obviously, this country cannot solve all the problems of the world, and I don't think America should do that. But I don't think America should be part of the problems that are existing in the world because of very serious, flawed I'm trying to get the logic here. Let me, let, me, let me see if I can figure this out. Because there are some people starving in this world, we should not defend our nation. Is that, that is what I'm hearing I'm not you say. No, I'm not no, talking I'm about defending the nation. If every nation has a right to defend itself. And, this and is, that is what we are th doing. This is exactly what um, Mr. But, Cohen said today in the United Nations by resolution, uh, by mandate 51. But... If you look at how we are defending ourselves, in other words, is going and bombing people, continuing to support tyrants around the world. I mean, we forget, like Michael pointed out, that Saddam Hussein was largely created by the West. And we have to deal with this fact. Now, hold on. If you look at... If, if you I look, could just talk for a I know. Here. Just let me finish my point here. If you look at, at the arms around the world, where are they produced and why aren't the producers taken to account? If, if France, Britain, the United States, I mean, this, we're supplying the world with weapons, and then when these weapons get out of control, we come in as the bully man and say, we, we're going to take these well, weapons out of your hands. It's not those weapons that the president was talking about. It's anthrax he was talking about. It's nuclear Supplied weapons. It's also things States. that haven't been. These, these chemicals were sent over by the United States but, between 1985 and 1989. You're, you're saying the United That's States gave them No, I'm not saying it. In 1994, U.S. Uh, Senate report said that we allowed these shipments to be made by American corporations to Iraq and they have been able to use right. the elements you know of what? those to create their weapons. It's it starts old, right it's here. It's an old Victoria debating Johnson. tactic. It's called straw man. It's an old debating tactic. All of us lawyers knew it. You just make, you just make up something and then you try to strike, strike it down. Listen to the words lawyer, of what? Michael Moore. Just None. may I finish? <laughs> You I'm said Halberton Gay. Yeah, made it through high school. Now let, let Victoria Tunsing <laughs> let Victoria Tunsing have her say, please. Thank you. Uh, how Burton sold things to Iraq that could have been used in a war, or sold things to Afghanistan that could have been used in a war. You can give uh, you can give food to a country, and then that can feed the army. This is ridiculous that you're just making up these things these about what wrong. our country has done and associating them with evil deeds when you know that for 10 years we have been absolutely adamant about taking away these weapons of mass destruction from Iraq. Do, uh, Michael, will you agree yeah. uh, that uh, uh, Iraq uh, used... Uh, poison gas and killed 5,000 Iraqi Kurds yes. and thousands of Iranian soldiers. Wouldn't you agree? That is correct. Okay. And one and year, they and still one year, it. and one year after they did that in 1984, yeah. on November 26, 1985, yeah. the United States uh, returned full diplomatic recognition 
to listen, Iraq. Listen, well, uh, I will tell you, I'm going to explain, look, I want to, explain to you. And so you know, it's not them. like cutting a we cloth. We gave Saddam $3 no. billion dollars in aid, if, which if helped the, him to buy these weapons. Yes, That's the ugly to, past of listen, this. Okay. You, won't, you don't listen. If, uh, the, if the United States believes uh, that at the time Iran is a greater threat and that Iran and Iraq are in, engaged in a battle, they're going to help the lesser threat. And there's nothing wrong uh, with oh, yes. that. Uh, well, I don't think okay. there is. Okay, all right. Sheikh Hamza, I want you to clarify one thing. What, what is your position on what happened at the UN today and what Bush said? Well, are you against the resolutions being... Uh, having a force attached to them to impose them on I, Iraq? I think it's absolutely necessary for the United States in order to reestablish some moral credibility in the world that it needs to work within the constraints of international law. And I, and I think that unfortunately what I read today was in a sense you need to agree with us or you're irrelevant. In other words, you need to, to be on board, make this a multilateral war against Iraq or, or uh, you, you're, you're irrelevant. And I think the point made, India has not abided by resolutions about Kashmir, for instance. And, and so for one state it applies, but for other states it doesn't apply. And I think that's where people around the world feel that there is hypocrisy. And I think if, if, if it's established across the board, I think that everybody will breathe a sigh of relief. But when the United Nations is used as a rubber stamp, and the other re resolutions that are being ignored by other states are not applied, then this is where... You can't no. it, it, hold on a second. I want, I want to ask what the British position is on this, because Jeff Hoon, you said it's perfectly possible to take action under international law without a specific UN resolution. Is that still your position? Is your position that uh, while it might be nice to have UN resolutions, it doesn't matter if you don't get them? Well, the law says that if you are attacked, you can respond. Uh, and that doesn't require uh, a Security Council resolution. But clearly it is preferable to have a Security Council resolution. And I think it's important to note what President Bush actually said at the United Nations this afternoon. He said that the United States would work with the United Nations Security Council to meet the common challenge of Iraq. He said that the world must move deliberately, decisively, to hold Iraq to account. And he said that the United States would work with the United Nations Security Council for the necessary resolutions. Now that's not a unilateralist position. That is committing the United States to work with yeah. other countries in the United you Nations. You said if we're not careful, another resolution will just add to the pile of paperwork in New York. Well, that is why it's vitally important in the next paragraph he went on to say that those resolutions must then be enforced. There is no point in passing resolutions okay. if that is simply an obstruction to taking action. But the action that we're talking about is to remove a threat to our safety and security. If that can be achieved by diplomatic means, that's what we ideally want. If it cannot be, then we must recognize that we have to back up those resolutions by the threat of force. Herman Waltz, who asked the question, what do you think of what you've heard? <laughs> well, I think that it's easy to say uh, we should rely on resolutions, but I think you're all bypassing the question. They've been ignored. What are we to do? We can go back for another resolution and another resolution, but in times like this, uh, when we're being attacked, we can differ over the things that have happened in the past or other differences between other nations. If some other nation has an issue they want to take to the United Nations, let them do it. But we have an issue that's paramount to us, that threatens us, that people are di have died from. We must respond. So we, the United Nations, stands with us, or they're not part of us, and then they are irrelevant. Okay. Except, except, except it was not Iraq that attacked us. Oh, yes. And, and even, even George W. Bush and his yeah. people have admitted this week that there is no connection between Iraq but, and Al-Qaeda. But that is not why so, the United States is taking so on... No, so once they ran out of that excuse, now they've come up with a new one, that there's weapons of mass destruction. Do you doubt it? There, there have th we've heard this for twelve then you years. Then you doubt it. All right, twelve years. The fact let, is, we, well, let, uh, let, Mr. Blix, no, how can you let him? Mr. Blix, he, he, he's he's here on the panel. He can say, and you can say, but I wanted a little bit of democracy. I wanted one voter at the back to speak again because he was the person who challenged him. Yes, my, I'll come to my you. question basically asks why the United Nations should have any credibility if their resolutions are ignored. Now here is a resolution that uh, has been going going for ten years that we should be allowed to inspect. They obviously started an aggression, they lost, they agreed to these demands. Uh, and now they ignore them, okay? So, we now go back to the United Nations and we say, this is an issue for us. Why should we take this institution seriously if Iraq doesn't take it seriously? 
Yeah. I think sadly that, that not much of the world is taking it seriously. And that's the problem. It's not just the U.S. And it's not just Israel. It's not just Iraq. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, do we want to have a United Nations? I mean, in America, we don't even believe we should pay our dues to it. So it's, it's, we you know, rejoined UNESCO today. Well, Having been out of it for 20 years. It's, it's nothing like York. arriving with a check in hand to get them to do what you want. I, I don't know why you say the United States doesn't want to pay its dues. The United States we haven't has paid. the United Nations in New York. We subsidize it greatly in the city. Uh, we're and behind okay. by millions, and it, sir, if, we're behind it, by millions of if the United please, Nations please. is such yeah. a credible institution, then it doesn't need the United States. Okay. Ed Koch, why does it stand without uh, us? Ed Koch, uh, you want to answer that There's point? no question, by everyone's agreement, that uh, Iraq uh, now has two weapons of mass destruction, poison gas uh, and biological. And the question is, when will it have a nuclear capability? If it can manufacture its own uh, fissionable material, it'll be in a few months. If uh, it uh, requires that they get it elsewhere, and they will get it elsewhere because it's available for purchase elsewhere, then it can take anywhere uh, from two years uh, to uh, ten uh, years. Do we have to wait? until uh, they actually use the nuclear bomb on us. They, in fact, use the gas. They use the biological weapons. Why do you think they won't use uh, the nuclear weapon if they have it? And the nexus with the terrorism is this. Because Al-Qaeda has declared war on us and whoever else involved in those cells, that is a group out there that will use any weapon it can get a hold of to attack people in the United States and to kill Americans and to kill Jews and as, as they have said they want to do. So if there is a regime with a Saddam Hussein who has these weapons and there are groups out there, cells across the world who want those kinds of weapons, that is the link and that's why we must eliminate those weapons. Okay, the man in the blue shirt, the second row from the back there. Okay, um, why do we, America, get to keep our nuclear weapons even though we've used them on Japanese yeah. and we never know we might use them on Arabs next? Why do we why why do we get why to keep, why do we get no, to no, keep no. nuclear when, weapons when, we, when we've used them on Japanese and might use them I, on I, okay. Arabs next and yeah. other people right. might, might because not? The, because the okay, world the, the, in treaty relationships has established who in fact can have them, like Russia, like the United States. Uh, and there are countries that have violated a treaty that they signed, like uh, India and uh, Pakistan, uh, by developing them. Now, you may like the perfect world with the United States weaponless under these circumstances. Not me, brother. Nuclear weaponless, I think you mean. Okay, hold on. I, I, I don't want to go down that road any further because I want to go on. We've been on one question for a long time. A question from Chloe Matthews, please. Chloe Matthews. If George Bush's main objective is to overturn Saddam Hussein and install a new leader, why is his solution to bomb the voters? If, why, why if, is his, his if his main object objective is to overturn Saddam Hussein, George Bush, and install a new leader, why is his solution to bomb the voters? Jeff Hoon. Well, he does Iraqi voters. Do Iraqi that. voters. Well, the main objective, let's be clear, uh, is to rid the world of a threat from Saddam Hussein's possession of weapons of mass destruction. As has been already said, uh, a man who has used those uh, weapons against his own people. Now, if you're talking about the efforts that uh, the United States and the United Kingdom make over the no-fly zones in Iraq, our pilots are there risking their lives to protect Iraqi people from attacks from their own government, from the regime in Baghdad. They are there, and when they come under attack, they are perfectly entitled to defend themselves. And that is why, from time to time, it is necessary to bomb military facilities in Iraq, to bomb radars, to bomb missiles that are targeting those aircraft. To because water, otherwise, to bomb no, water they, treatment plants, I, to let, bomb let me make it absolutely facilities. clear. I am responsible for the activities of those pilots and those aircrew mm -hmm. over those no-fly zones. And I assure you, they only target those elements of the Iraqi machine that are targeting, attacking and them. The collateral damage? How about that? Hamza Yusuf, do you want to answer An enormous that? amount of effort is made to ensure that there are no civilian casualties. And if there is any doubt about a risk to civilians, those missions are not authorized. And I guarantee you that they are very seriously looked at every single time there is but, a mission involving British... Hold on, Hamza Yusuf, do you know how many children in Iraq have died 
Okay. During uh, these sanctions and the bombing, did uh, you, uh, the Michael UN Moore, statistic, Moore, I want to ask 500,000 I want, I want to ask Hamza Youssef to answer this. Well, I just, I feel, unfortunately, that we're not looking in terms of long term. We're dealing with a very complicated area, and we're looking at it very simplistically. The Arab world is, is, a, is a world that feels uh, united in the sense that they have an ethnic and linguistic bond. Anything that happens in Iraq affects the entire region. I visited Kuwait uh, two years ago, and the Kuwaitis of all the Arabs have been criticized for having a deep love for the American people. I went back uh, about six months ago, and I was shocked to see the same people had really felt that they'd been completely betrayed. And I think that that overwhelming feeling that will permeate the Arab world will create much more insecurity in our world and allow for much more opportunity to attack this country. And that's why I personally feel that we can't, there, there is going to be a straw that breaks the camel's back eventually. Can there, I give Michael as well some facts about child mortality in Iraq? Child mortality since the Gulf War in those areas of Iraq controlled by the regime has doubled. In those areas not controlled by the regime, child mortality is actually falling. One of the reasons for that is that some three billion dollars worth of money that is available to the Iraqi regime to spend on medicines, on help for people in Iraq, not actually spent. That money instead goes on buying weapons. Moreover, Iraq has very recently been shown to be exporting baby milk. Now why is Iraq making money out of exploiting its own people, allowing its own children to die, simply to sustain an evil regime? That's what's going on in Iraq. That's because Michael they want to kill their own children. The, the woman in the third row. Human. What is happening? My question is. Uh, my question is, what you see, uh, what you envision as a successor regime in Iraq? Like, okay. if you do get rid of Saddam Hussein, what do you want there? Do you want a stable democratic regime, or are you going to put in someone else who's also another military, mm -hmm. perhaps dictator, who's just more sympathetic with the U.S.? Well, a year on in Afghanistan, we are helping a transitional government there rebuild their country. No one pretends that that can be done overnight. Uh, no one pretends in Iraq that suddenly there will be a democratic country. But you imagine the difference a year on. A year ago, a, a, a Taliban regime were abusing human rights in Iraq, were allowing, sorry, in, in Afghanistan, were allowing the country to be uh, used as a haven for terrorists. Now we have the prospect of a country that is being rebuilt, that the government is struggling with many of the problems that they have to face, but one day, yes, there can be democratic elections in Afghanistan, and I see no reason why Iraq reincorporated into the international community itself could not have a democratic Perhaps government. Perhaps we could no, install no, an no. oil company executive in Iraq like we did in Afghanistan as the president. The man in the, uh, in the, the open neck shirt there, you sir, in the second row, yes. No, not you, you've spoken already, yes, you sir. I just want to ask Jeff Hoon how he can say that Afghanistan seems to be being, re being rebuilt. It seems to me that every area outside of Kabul is being taken back by warlords and people that used to run separate areas. What are, what's being done outside of Kabul itself? That, that, that's simply not the case. And I've been to Afghanistan twice in the last six months. Have you been outside there Kabul? There, there is an enormous amount of progress. I have Kabul. been outside Kabul, yes. And uh, there is progress. I'm not pretending, and no one should pretend. No one should pretend. Nobody should pretend that one, this is going to be two? resolved overnight. None. An enormous amount of effort <laughs> is being made. And I mean, seriously, just over 12 months ago, the regime in Afghanistan allowed that country to be used to train the people who uh, brought such death and destruction to the United States. Now there is a government there seeking to try and restore that country as part of the international community, seeking eventually to have democratic elections. That's an enormous progress. It's a progress that's been brought about by the international community and above all else by the United States. And you know, as the only woman on this panel, I would like to point out the horrendous treatment of women under the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda Al people. I cannot, I cannot imagine that the women in at least Kabul are not better off today than they were a year ago not being allowed to have education. Of course, Michael, I would love for you to criticize the old government and how they treated women, but you just criticize the United States government. I, take, I criticize the things I'm responsible for first. That's true. I, it's just well, the way I was raised. I'm responsible for the United you States know. government, but I would like well, to see I am. your I'm criticism. A it's, it's I'd like a to see your criticism here okay. 
at governments who, who treat children, as the secretary just pointed out, in the way that Saddam Hussein uh, gives no money to the children. Baby milk, and right? yes, the baby I would, milk story. I was. I and know. I, I was, would like for you to I was criticize by that. the Afghan was, government was, that treated women as yeah. if they were not even you know, persons. You know, can I can I remind you when you Don't you were in the you were in the you were in the uh, Reagan administration, oh. correct? Right. Yes. And. Um, I was you, also Barry Goldwater's chief counsel. I'm an old-time wow. Republican. Uh, okay. Uh, I have to <laughs> digest that one. Uh, you sent, your administration sent up to Capitol Hill a little Kuwaiti girl that testified in front of Congress telling the story about how the Iraqis had come into Kuwait and came into the hospitals and took the babies out of the incubator and put the babies on that the cold the floor. And then it turned out... That was the Bush administration. Reagan, you Bush gotta won. get your Reagan history Bush, right. Reagan get your Bush. Right. All right. It's the same cabal as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Anyways, they t this you understand that this little girl testified, and it turned out that she was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador. That it was all a lie. It was all made up to get us to go into the Gulf War. Just like Colin Powell saying that there were five hundred thousand five hundred thousand Iraqi troops ready to invade Saudi Arabia. It then turns out that there were 180,000, far less than what he said. All these things to sort of juice up the lie. Were you against the invasion of Kuwait? By which country? By the United States and the Allies that did it. <laughs> I'm against the invasion of any country. Yeah, were you against into the invasion? Any country. Well, sorry, were you against the invasion of Kuwait? It's a simple question Absolutely. by the Allies after Absolutely. you were. Absolutely. Sh Iraq should have been left there. Yeah. They weren't going to be left there. Uh, what was going to happen? What was going to happen? Yeah. Well, I don't know what was going to happen. I guess we never found out, did we? Well, we know, you know? that when yeah, they I okay. what, our they job just destroyed every our aspect job, of Kuwait. Yeah. Our job was to reinstate the dictator of Kuwait, which we succeeded in doing. Okay. Those right. people are no more free today in Kuwait. So you would have you talk about women's rights. I mean, it's like occupy oh. Kuwait right. and <laughs> Saudi Arabia, right? No, of course not. You know well, that. No, everyone actually, on this actually, panel actually, and everyone in this that. audience actually, agrees that yeah. Saddam Hussein is a bad guy. And everyone agrees that whoever committed the mass murder here in New York should be tried and punished. We all agree on that, okay? So don't, don't go down about, that. Yeah, how about yeah. that person uh, that is a threat to the United States who has used poison gas, who has used biological weapons, who we our believe, weapons, who, right, what difference our, does it what make? Difference? What we difference? We gave him weapons! Benetti just shouts believes, to get your point made. You we believe that he well. is on the verge of nuclear weaponry, okay. and you think we should I leave him alone? I think that's a lie. Well, I think it's a uh, Bush lie. All right, well, we've got, we've got got a it's disagreement that we aren't, aren't going to resolve and we only have in my judgment somewhere like 15 or 12 minutes to go and I want to move on to another question. Uh, from Samir Arora please. Samir Arora. Yeah. Is there a special relationship between the United States and Britain or is that just a convenient way of Britain to feel globally important? <laughs> <laughs> What's your view? <laughs> Well, I don't know. It, it comes to what has the United States done for Britain in the recent past? Uh, Jeff Hoon, do we just... <laughs> I think there is a very special relationship, and I think it was demonstrated graphically on the, uh, uh, on the afternoon, as it was in the United Kingdom, of September the 11th, a year ago. And uh, what you had there was not a calculation by the people of the United Kingdom, or indeed its government, of what was in the best interests of... Uh, of my country it was uh, uh, an instinctive outpouring of concern for friends, for relatives, uh, for people in the Ministry of Defense, for example, who work closely alongside their counterparts here in the United States. It, it was an instinctive feeling, and I don't believe that any two countries in the world are closer in that way. So it's not, it's not a special relationship between governments in that sense. It's a special relationship with, between two peoples who share a great common history and a great but, but, approach but you, but to your uh, government, democracy and but, human rights. But your government uh, has uh, opposition to its stance on the invasion of Iraq and on President Bush's stance. So you can't, you can't conflate the government with the British people, can you? Uh, we live in a democracy, and, and it's right in a democracy that there will be a range of views. I'm not at all surprised that there are uh, people opposed to a whole set of actions that the government take. But our job is to represent the majority opinion in the country, to set out the case uh, if it is necessary to take action in relation to Iraq, and, uh, and actually to answer the critics that uh, pose the questions. They're How, entitled in a democracy to put their questions. Equally, it is the responsibility of government to answer them. Do you, just to take a question that somebody here, I haven't got time to take it, but do you think that the, uh, that the United 
United States would be willing to go to war in Iraq in the absence of support from Britain? I, that's how a important matter, is Blair well, and how important are you? I, I think that's, uh, that is a matter for the United States. I can't speak for the government of the United States, but I think we saw uh, at the United Nations today President Bush commit himself not just to uh, seeking the support of the United Kingdom, but actually to seeking the support of the international community through uh, a United Nations process. And I think that demonstrates uh, overwhelmingly that this is not simply about the United States acting unilaterally. It's about the United States engaging, as they did over Afghanistan, with the international community. Sheikh Hamza? You know, again, I think that, that we're, we're not looking at the real issue here about a war that is possibly going to happen, and it's very likely. And I feel that that's, for me, the most important issue here is that more innocent people are going to suffer over uh, something that we really are just saying, you know, he might. And in the last 10 years, he has not. He is setting up his son to be an inheritor. I think he knows very well what the United States can do. The United States can, can basically create a massive explosion in Iraq, as it has done before, wipe out their, what's left of their infrastructure. And I, and I just feel that Saddam Hussein, even though there's nobody here that will defend him, I certainly will not defend him. I would like to see him gone. Most of the Arabs would like to see him gone, but to take him out now, I think, is going to further polarize an already polarized world. Can, and, can, can and I now ask you to answer the question? Uh, about this question? Yes. Well, uh, I, I think it's sad. Whether it's about the relationship between I, yeah, how I, important Britain is I think in that it's sad President to Bush see that Britain, the Lion of Britain, become a, a feather in the, in the American eagle. Uh, I would like to see Britain be a moral voice once again. Some of the greatest progressive traditions in Western civilization came out of Britain. And, and I would like to see, because Britain, they are great friends of America, and I feel that it is friends that can give sincere advice. It's not enemies. And I think Tony Blair is of heroic quality, willing to do what's right, irrespective uh, of uh, the uh, opposition of some people in uh, his uh, party who are uh, at the fringe, I uh, believe. They need him more than he needs them. What do, you, what do you make of what the French president said, which is it's well, he's not... Well, moved it's in not, favor. It's not the French and the Germans on one side and Bush and Blair on the other. It's Bush and Blair on one side and all the others that's on the other true. side. And, that's and, not and, true. That's not true. Chirac has changed his position uh, and is much closer today to uh, Bush uh, than he was uh, a week ago. The fact is, I think that Bush has been brilliant because what he has said as a result of everything prior to the UN and now at the UN, he's saying the ball's in your court. If you bring this uh, man to the table uh, where he uh, uh, carries out uh, all of the requirements that he submitted uh, to when we defeated him uh, in 91, then there's no problem. But if you are unwilling, and they have been unwilling for 10 years, if you, the UN, are unwilling uh, to do your duty, we will do it. Okay. We will not st uh, stand by uh, and be subject to a nuclear attack at a later time. The man in the blue shirt, then, said Yes, there's a great discussion here about Iraq, but I haven't heard about, say, Syria or Sudan or other areas which have known terrorist tendencies. Does that mean that we, after we invade Iraq, should we also make plans to start Depends invading? Depends on if they're threats. For example, people have, history is well known. threats to our national security. Bush said something that was remarkable uh, early on. He said, we're going to go after the terrorists and the countries that harbor them. When so we, we take out Syria, Iraq, the these other countries yeah. will no longer, in my judgment, harbor okay. terrorists. The, the, man, Saudi Arabia. the man on the right there, in the yellow <laughs> shirt, you <laughs> said. <laughs> yes. Don't you think the Bush administration looks a bit incompetent in that it's taken till now to say what he said today? Yeah. If he'd said it three months ago, he wouldn't have had half the opposition that, that he's had. You think it was late in the day to... Yeah, why, why do you think it was so late? I don't know. The internal okay. poli policy decisions or you sound, arguments you, or... From your accent, it's not difficult to discern that you sound <laughs> British. What do you think about the question that was asked about whether uh, Britain's role in all this is important or just a way of making Britain feel important by tagging along with the United States? What's your uh, view? A bit of both. Uh, well, wash a, <laughs> that doesn't get us very far. Any other, any other British people in the audience who'd just like to s speak to that? Yes, you, sir, the spectacles there. I think little. America will act alone regardless, and I think they've shown that with the Kyoto Agreement, with steel tariffs, with the International Court. So I think uh, uh, it's going to happen. Okay. America will attack. Okay, okay. yes. Uh, yeah. I'd just like to, to address the, the, the history that we've been talking about of whether the UN has any credibility. I don't think for about a decade the United States had any credibility. 
because when the World Trade Center bombing occurred in 1993, we did nothing. We settled it only by the, the criminal law, which doesn't always work. When our ship was bombed, the coal was bombed, we did nothing. When the, the towers in Saudi Arabia were bombed, we did nothing. And I think this president has surprised those people who are the terrorists because for the first time we have responded to an attack. And for a long time, we were just like the UN. Does Britain, we does Britain ignored Israel it. matter in this? Does Blair matter in this? I, well, I think it, it very much does. But well, I think we know this president now well enough to know that even if the, the Brits weren't so wonderful and supportive, that he would probably go it okay. alone. Michael Moore, can you just address the British point in this and Britain's role? I think it's, uh, like I said just briefly here, it's very sad that uh, um, uh, what's happened to labor in, in your country? I just, uh, we were all so excited when Blair, you know, tossed all the Thatcherites and the Tories out. It was such a great moment uh, just watching it from here, thinking, God, could that ever happen in this country? You know, where like, virtually all the Republicans would be tossed out. And, and, to, and to go down this road, to go this far, and to get behind George W. Bush. You look at Blair and Bush side by side, and you see one man who really looks and is intelligent and knows better. <laughs> And why he's, why he's propping up somebody who clearly uh, doesn't know what's going on uh, is you just, know, it's a sad thing to see. I thought you Jeff only Hood. criticized countries where you're a taxpayer. I've talked about the special relationship, but I think it goes further than the instinctive concern that the UK people had for people in the United States. It is also about working closely with a, a government that thinks very much alike. But, no, but what, what Mr. Moore said was that you had a, a clever prime minister supporting a stupid president. Well, I don't. <laughs> Can I talk about that? I, I, don't, I don't accept that for a moment. Let, and, no, but, I mean, uh, this guy used to be the good guy. Let me what respond happened? to that. Okay, the hey, president. Coach, yeah. Let me just tell you something. The radical left has said the same thing about Ronald Reagan, and then they found 600 handwritten speeches, and everybody said, the guy is very smart. They don't like uh, uh, Bush, so instead of dealing with him on substantive issues, what they'll do is try to denigrate him and dehumanize him. I am saying, you lost. And when, uh, I'm, not, I'm talking about the argument, uh, not here, but uh, here and outside of this uh, room. The vast majority of Americans agree with Bush, not with you. No, that's not true. The vast majority, this has to be cleared up, yeah. the vast majority of Americans believe that if the Allies are not with us on this, we should not no. be going to war no. with Iraq. No. That's what the okay. okay. no, You say, yes. No, hold on. Come on the second row. You say. No. Yes, sir. Um, I think as a Brit, we, we are in somewhat of an identity crisis. I mean, we do definitely have more of a kinship with America than we do with France, Germany, and Holland. So as part of the EC, should we maybe, uh, you know, think we, 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 I think we're too American at times, but we're definitely more of a kinship with America than we do with the rest of How Europe. How do you respond to what Mr. Moore says about uh, our Prime Minister and the American President? No comment. <laughs> Okay, and the, the woman at the very back there, or is it a man? I can't see a man, sorry. Oh, Thank sorry. you. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, as being a Brit myself, uh, first of all, I'd like to say to Michael Moore, if he doesn't like Britain, he doesn't like America, go and live in the Far East somewhere. You know. You're running, you're running down this country, you're running down the Western world. If you don't like it, get out. And we should... And the Brits, Mr. Moore, yes. And the Brits should be backing whatever the Americans want to do. Do it now. Remember 1938. You see, I think I answer that. Uh, I think that the, that's part of your problem, is the ghost of Chamberlain. And you've got to get over it. You made one mistake, you know? It's okay. It's, it's, it's sad that you made it. But, but for Blair to be worrying, to try and invent that, well, this may happen, or it could happen. If we introduce the doctrine of a preemptive strike for something that has presented one shred of evidence, Okay. of these potential nuclear devices That's that Ed talked about. All right. We've been round this, we've been round this ground. I want, we're coming to the end. I want to just put a question. We're in, we're in, we're in... Than questioning your government. We're in... We're in New York, and I want a question from Laura Burton Fairbrother, please. What do you feel would be, um, personally, a suitable tribute to the heroes um, and the victims of the terror attacks at the sites of the fallen World Trade Center? Sheikh Hamza. Well, I, you know, I, that's probably some of the most expensive property in Manhattan, and, and I would think that it would be a great testimony uh, 
if this country did decide to make it a memorial. Just do nothing. Though. Yes. Ed Koch? Uh, lots of people have different uh, views. My own uh, view is that you build the most sensitive uh, memorial uh, ever created. That doesn't mean it's the biggest uh, memorial. The uh, two that come to my mind as the most sensitive in the world are uh, the eternal flame on uh, uh, Jack Kennedy's grave uh, and the uh, monument for the Vietnam uh, War. But I'm going to leave that to those who are far better than I. But one of the great uh, monuments is to have 50,000 people once again in that area working and uh, showing the terrorists you can't defeat New York. We have spines of steel. Okay. Michael Moore. I think it should be a memorial. I don't think there should be commerce there. Um, Ed, you know, I, I'm sure you, I know you have very strong beliefs, and I think a lot of the people watching the show do. You have to ask yourself, uh, do you, are your beliefs so strong that you would fly yourself into a building at 500 miles an hour because... Because if your enemy's beliefs are, who wins that war? Then you're dealing it, with well, animals. To, let me just finish. Animals. Well, we need, they're not, they're, well, they're human beings who, are, who have well, committed an act of human mass being murder. Is an okay. But let me just finish my point. And a mass murderer. The best memorial we can give to the dead here is to not reduce our freedoms and shred our civil liberties here at home, but to increase our freedoms, to show the world that this is a free country and not to become a more closed society and to engage like Bush in and Ashcroft and the others have done. You are Victor engaging Victor in impeachment. Victor all right, hold on, Victoria Pelosi. It's latitude that I don't even know how to put a body on. It's not a platitude. I think we have that new laws now that have taken away certain freedoms right, that we've Victoria, had for 200 years. Let I think the best speak. memorial that we could leave for those people is to eliminate terrorism and to see to it that the world is safer. Okay. Um, yes, the woman in the second row from the back there. Um, I wondered whether the uh, the two lights that they had for a month or so uh, was seemed to be a great memorial for, okay. um, and it, around the world everybody, you know, seemed to uh, relate to that. Could Jeff we not have something like that again? Well, well, clearly there must be a memorial of some sort. But I attended the commemoration at the Pentagon yesterday morning, and what I found deeply impressive there was not only the commemoration of those who died, but the fact was that the building had been reconstructed people were back at work, and what they were demonstrating there is that we will not be intimidated, we will not be defeated by terrorism. So I think one memorial certainly will be for New York to get on to be the great, exciting, vigorous city, a part of a great country that it has always been, to okay. show terrorists that we cannot be defeated. That's it. I'm afraid our hour's up. Thank you very much.